So um, QCon London is um, my favorite place to give a talk. Uh, it's both my uh, most exciting and most terrifying talk because I almost always give the brand new shiny live demo first at this, uh, at this conference. So this is the place where it's either gonna fail horribly or um, not fail quite so horribly. Uh, there really is no success at this. So anyway, but you are always an amazing audience, she said, setting expectations accordingly. So uh, and you're always extremely supportive of my trials and tribulations. <laughs> yes. So yes, so I'm Trisha. I work for JetBrains. I'm a developer advocate working mostly with IntelliJ IDEA and also with Upsource, which is our code review tool. Um, and this talk is uh, basically, Trish, can you talk about Java 9-ish? So, um, so I am. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to do a little bit about Jigsaw in action, even though I promised I wasn't going to do anything about Jigsaw. Um, and I'm going to look, uh, spend quite a bit of time looking at reactive programming in Java 9, and that's because the reactive APIs are built into uh, Java the language. So I think it's going to be quite interesting to understand how reactive programming works in, in Java to get a feel for what this means for us. And then I'm going to um, spend uh, some time, depending on how long this takes, uh, looking at some of the other Java 9 features that we as developers are probably going to find reasonably interesting. So first and foremost, uh, I think it's really important to understand why we should care about Java 9. Uh, it's not just because it's the latest and greatest and the shiniest. And at some point, you're probably going to have to go to your bosses and say whether or not it's worth going to Java 9, given, oh, who's using Java 8 at the moment? That's fantastic. Who isn't using Java 8 yet? <coughs> Who's an Android developer? Some of you, okay, that makes sense. Um, is anyone using Java 9 yet? Really, that's adventurous. <laughs> Um, yes, okay, so let's have a quick talk about why we want to know about Java 9. It's coming out this year, probably July-ish, they tell us, we don't really know. Um, is Brian in the room? I hope not, because then he can not tell me what's wrong with my Java 9 talk. Um, so we, we really want to have a feel for why we might think about upgrading to Java 9. And we get free stuff with Java 9. If we upgrade to Java 9, just run our um, applications on Java 9 without doing anything, without making use of any of the new features, we get better use of memory, better performance of a bunch of different stuff, we get better use of hardware, we get um, better Javadoc documentation. It comes with a new search field, and you can do HTML5 Javadoc, um, which is terribly exciting. Um, some improvements around graphics and faster compilation. So there are some, there's some really nice changes which have gone into Java 9, which you can take advantage of straight away, uh, just come kind of free out of the box. Um, of course, whenever anyone talks about Java 9, they can't help but talk about Jigsaw because this is the big thing, and it's only been sort of a work in progress for about, you know, five million years, and we're eventually going to get it in Java 9, whatever that means. So this is the sort of the big ticket item for Java 9. Um, a bunch of people are talking about the REPL. Who's heard of the Java 9 REPL? A few of you, so read eval print loop, so the ability to kind of try out Java statements on the command line, which is not really a way that we as Java developers are used to working. You have it with things like Clojure and a bunch of JavaScript ways of doing stuff, um, but it's not really a traditional Java way of working. So the REPL's quite interesting, and we are not going to have time to see it today. I'm so sorry. Um, and then everyone's like, okay, so what else is there? You get some free stuff, and you get Jigsaw, and you get the REPL, but what is there for me as a developer? So we're going to look at some of the other things which, came in, which is coming into Java 9. It's now sort of feature complete, so there's one or two things which are going to be available whenever Java 9 is finally released. Now, I usually, especially given uh, live demos, slightly fraught with danger, so I do usually try and set expectations appropriately low. Um, don't use Java 9 in production yet. It's not out yet, it's not ready yet. It is, um, it is an early access release. So you can download Java 9, it is being updated fairly regularly. You can download an early access and try it out in your applications or in a new application. Um, the other thing which is early access at the moment is the IntelliJ IDEA version that I'm going to be using here is the one that's not quite out yet as well. So something will definitely go wrong and, um, and I'm ready for this, I can take it. 
Um, and of course, we can't really talk about best practice with a, a, a version of Java which isn't out yet. So we don't really know what best practice looks like yet for Java 9. Um, we're only just starting to see some of these best practice type things for Java 8 with lambdas and streams. So all I can really give you is a kind of sneak peek on um, some of the features of Java 9, how I found them reasonably useful for me to work with um, in a sort of real live code base. Um, and then from there, you can get a feel for perhaps what sorts of things are coming in Java 9. The case study. Uh, two years ago, I did a live demo, probably in this very room, uh, about Java 8 in anger. Uh, frankly, I think I should have called this Java 9 in anger because Jigsaw made me quite angry. Um, and the Java 8 in anger talk was about JavaFX, a real-time real dashboard which responds to tweets, parses tweets and does some interesting stuff with them and um, shows them on, uh, on this dashboard. And the point of that was to kind of dem demonstrate a bunch of Java 8 features. Now, what I wanted to do is just take the same application and migrate it to Java 9, make use of some of the Java 9 features, particularly because this was always a kind of um, event-driven type architecture, which lends itself quite nicely to the sort of reactive APIs. Uh, the architecture of this was it's kind of got some very tiny services. I wouldn't say microservices because they're not reliable and they don't do any reporting or anything that's useful for microservices. But I have a bunch of independent services. And so we'll have a look at some of those independent services, see how they work, and see how um, the Java 9 features impact them. Um, I could, yeah, let's do a fraught with danger and try and see if we can get it up and running so I can show you what it looks like. So the first place where it can go wrong. And you know when you're like compiling stuff on your, on your computer and someone looks over your shoulder and it takes like about 500 times longer than it normally does? That's what this experience is like. There's like 700 of you in this room. All right, so I've got, what I'm doing is I'm starting three independent services on the back end. One is a service which sends tweet-like information. Um, one is a service which parses the, the usernames out of the tweet, and one is a service which kind of gets an idea of what the mood of that tweet is. Is it kind of vaguely happy? Is it kind of vaguely sad? And then I have a JavaFX dashboard which kind of renders this on the screen. So this is the application that we're going to be um, uh, refactoring to use some Java 9 features and uh, architectures. Let's shut all that down. I'm surprised that worked. That's the first test passed. Excellent. And so if you're interested in the original use case, I'm not going to go into the details of how that was built because I've already talked about that and it's available online and um, I don't need to bore you with the details. Uh, these slides are obviously available online so you don't have to like, take pictures of the thing. So Java 9, I can't really go anywhere with Java 9 without talking about the elephant in the room, which is Jigsaw. And I really did want to get away without talking about Jigsaw in a Java 9 talk, but it turned out that my project was a multi-module project using Gradle, and um, Gradle, the current version of Gradle with the particular version of Groovy and the particular version of Java 9 in IntelliJ doesn't work so at the moment, and they are working on it. But it means that my multi-module project, which was so amazing under Java 8, um, doesn't work under Java 9, so I decided why not just like port it to Jigsaw to see what happens. Um, the, one of the things I had to do was actually had to change, I don't know if this is absolutely mandatory, but I had to change the directory structure of the project. So what I had before was a kind of typical Groovy, like um, Groovy and uh, Gradle and Maven style directory structure with my sort of source main Java, source test Java um, type of uh, directory structure. And in order to turn it into a jigsaw friendly modular system, I ended up having to have like a top level source directory and then all of my modules under that and the top level test directory and all my test modules underneath that. And this is much more in line with the sort of recommendations from both the Jigsaw Quick Start tutorial and this is what the, the JDK um, layout looks like if you look at the JDK code itself. Um, and so what you'll see with that is now I have a, a module info file, which is the kind of the configuration of your Java 9 jigsaw module um, for each of my production <coughs> modules, but I don't have one for my test classes because the test classes are in the same modules, uh, the same package name, and so there's a package name clash, and so the easiest way for me to get this to work, certainly for demo purposes, was to not turn my test classes into real modules, just have the IDE take care of the dependencies, and so I run the tests inside the IDE. So this is, not, this is definitely not best practice, but it, it does work, more or less. 
So one of the interesting things about modularizing my code is um, I had a look at the dependencies between my modules, and these are the things which, these are the dependencies I already had. I already had a modular structure in my code. Um, and then I thought, well, let's have a look and see if my dependencies are right. And it turned out that I had some weird conflict of ideas inside my head when I created my original modules. For example, my two backend services, my mood service and my user service, both depend upon code from my Twitter service. And when I thought about it, I thought, well, that makes no sense. I mean, it can listen to the Twitter service, but it shouldn't be sharing code from the Twitter service. That's kind of a bit weird. I also see that my client code has access to the WebSocket API library, as well as the WebSocket implementation, which I also didn't know why that was either. And then I have a, a separate module which um, is necessary at the moment, which is going to do the conversion between my Java 8 reactive, Java 9 reactive streams API and the org.reactivestreams reactive streams API, um, which, is called, um, which is called Flow. And this module was dependent upon reactive streams, but also inexplicably so was my service module. So by drawing out what my dependencies were, I could actually see that I had some weird um, dependencies that I didn't really need. And, Jigsaw kind of brought this to my attention because I had to think about what my dependencies were, what were my modules really using. So I went away and rethought about it and I ended up with a much simpler structure. And with this one, all of my independent services are now independent services. They don't depend upon each other. They do depend upon the service class, the service module, which is all my infrastructure code for services. So that seems correct, which depends upon WebSockets because my implementation is WebSockets. Um, and then my three backend services, my Twitter service, my user service, and my mood service, are all dependent upon RxJava because those are the only services which use RxJava. And then I also have, and um, those ones also have to depend upon my adapter between Reactive Streams implementation and the Java 9 implementation. So here I found Jigsaw really useful for kind of helping me to, um, forcing me to look at the modular structure in my code, to look at the dependencies, to see whether they made any sense at all. Um, which was kind of a bit tiresome because I really didn't want to be looking at Jigsaw at all. I just wanted to get on with the code. Uh, let's, have a t let's take a quick look at what this means. Um, all of this talk, by the way, is going to be sort of very, each topic is going to be quite high level. So if you're kind of interested in Jigsaw, for example, there are lots of talks and documentation already available on Jigsaw, and there will be more this year, I'm sure. So I'm not going to do like a, a deep dive onto each topic. I'm just going to do a sort of high level, oh, look, this is what it looks like in the code. And then if you're interested, you can go away and find out more information later. So let's look at um, trying to implement a Jigsaw module inside real code. And let's check out the right branch. So, <clears throat> um, what you've got, you don't really need to be able to see the, the words there, but um, so this is one of my backend modules. It doesn't currently have a module info. My other modules have a module info. So in order to turn this into a module, it needs to have the module info file. So I'll create one of those, new module info. IntelliJ makes a reasonable guess as to what the name of the module is, but it's not quite right. I need to put some dots in here. No doubt this functionality will evolve over time. And so now when I compile, Java 9 is going to say, okay, this needs to sort of conform to all the, the jigsaw modularity way of doing stuff, and so now I'm gonna give you loads of errors and warnings about what you've done wrong. And so now I'm using a, a Java library class, I'm using the, the Java logger, but I need to declare that I'm going to use that module. I'm not going to get it by default. So if I alt enter onto that, oh, typically I, the, the font is not very big, um, but I can add requires Java logging to the module info. So if we have a look at that, then I can start to build up the dependencies that my module has. And, um, and get those added into my module info file. Similarly, I need to add reactive streams to the class path, and I need to add my dependency on uh, reactive streams into my, uh, into my module info. So here I actually have two different types of dependency. One is a module from inside the JDK, so that's part of Java, but I have to declare that I want to use it because I got, don't get it by default. And another is me using an external library, the reactive streams library. 
and I have to de declare both of those. And the other thing that I can do inside um, my module file is I don't just talk about the things that I use, I can also talk about the things that I'm going to let others use from my module, otherwise there's not a lot of point in creating a module if no one's going to use you. So here, what we see is this is code from a different module. So here, this is inside the user module. And the error here is um, package com.mechanitas.sense.flow is not visible from inside this module. The, um, the flow module needs to export it. Now, there's no magic auto fix for this. Uh, so I can say exports the package name. I only have one package name in that particular module. So this is a very simple module, which has a dependency on two other modules and exports one module for other people to use. There are some slightly more complicated ones. For example, here's my module for the client. And these, these things I kind of figured out by kind of trial and error, because as you're running it, it tells you you need to import your JavaFX modules. And then when you try and run it as well, JavaFX, I assume, uses, um, uses reflection or uses, I don't know, some sort of callback or something. You have to say that your, um, that your packages are open to JavaFX as well. So there are, there are different things you do inside your, depend, inside your module configuration file. You can configure the, the, all the visibility of all of your packages now. It's much more configurable than it used to be. Um, and I've left that comment in there because it told me I needed to export two packages that I'm not sure I actually want to export. So again, Jigsaw is kind of making me think about the design. Is this really what I want to do? Are these things really supposed to be visible or not? Is that what I want to do? Uh, and there's another, um, another one. Uh, on my service side, um, what I found was I did this by pure brute trial and error, trying to figure out which modules I had a dependency on. And then when you, have, when you try and run it, you get runtime exceptions where like, you've got missing classes and things like that, and because you don't get all the errors at compile time. So I highly recommend that you read the documentation, understand how the JDEPS tool works, so that you don't have to do this by a very difficult trial and error way, which is what I did. So, uh, so yes, there was a... There, there was a certain amount of pain in moving to an early access version of Java 9. For example, Gradle wasn't working for me. Uh, I am reliably told they are working on it. Um, I chose to reorganize the file structure to be more in line with the, the Jigsaw recommendations. And of course, reorganizing the file structure of your project is a non-trivial thing to do. Um, and because of the way I've chosen to put my production files in one into the modules, but my test classes are not in the module system. I currently have no command line build for this. I can only run it through the IDE. So this is not production ready the way it is right now. And the IDE support for things like IntelliJ IDEA, it, it is there for Jigsaw. You saw that I can generate a module info. I get a certain amount of auto completion for some of the keywords, but we don't get all the magic auto fix things that we're, we're used to inside um, Java, well, if you're using Java 8 or whatever. So the IDE support across all the IDEs is definitely getting there for Java 9, um, but when you're starting to adopt these new things, there's going to be a certain amount of, um, it's important to understand what's happening under the covers because you might need to do some things manually. Um, so yes, so you really do need to go away and, and read about stuff like Jigsaw if you're going to do something like that. So enough of that. Let's get on to the interesting reactive thing because that's what I put into the abstract to get this accepted for the conference. That's not true. That's not very true. Um, <laughs> So my services are actually very, are quite dumb, and this is intentional because I want my services to be very simple. I want them to be independent. They happen to use WebSockets, and the WebSocket protocol, you can choose to send strings. So all I'm really getting is like a string input and a string input uh, output. I could do more than that with my services, but I've just chosen I get like some series of string inputs and some series of string outputs. So... Um, the, what I do, obviously, is you plug the business logic in between those things, but all I really needed for my application was a really simple mapper. So I, I get some string value, I map it through some magic, either into a username or into a mood or into something fairly simple and end up with some sort of string output. And so what I thought, and this is what it looks like, so it takes a function of string to string, and when you call it, you give it like um, a lambda expression because, you know, this is a Java 8 demo, so I was supposed to be injecting lambda expressions. What I thought that would be kind of more useful for the architecture of this particular application is really what's happening is under the covers, the input is a publisher. So it's publishing strings to my business logic. 
So I can publish a stream of strings, and the output subscribes to some set of outputs from the business logic. So my publisher is publishing a stream of strings. My subscriber is listening to a stream of strings that are probably a different shape to the original stream of strings. And then again, I have my business logic somewhere in the middle doing something to those streams. So I want to go ahead and, and do this change because the publisher and subscriber interfaces are the things which come in in Java 9. So Java 9 has the uh, reactive streams API built in. Let's have a look at what that looks like. So my service, <clears throat> my service class is fairly stupid, really. Well, simple, sorry, simple to understand. Um, and I have the client endpoint end point is the input to the service, and the broadcasting server endpoint end point is the output of the service. So what I want to do is I'm first going to change my output to be um, a subscriber. And I'm going to cheat slightly. So I already had this idea of a message listener. I already had an interface, which was a message listener, which takes a string message. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat slightly by changing this to the same signature as one of the methods on subscriber. So I can much more easily migrate from my custom message listener to the, the reactive stream subscriber. So then what I'll do is I can now implement subscriber. And that's going to take a string. Let's take a quick look at what this looks like. Um, so, my this is, so this is part of the Java 9 um, library. So I get a subscriber, which has an on subscribe, an on next, which is the thing that gets called with every single message, which gets passed in, an on error, and an on complete. So those are the things I need to implement in order to be a subscriber. So I'll implement those. My on subscribe is the thing that gets called when something, so I'm, um, I am a subscriber, so when I subscribe to something, I get given a subscription. So what I want to do is I, I just want to do a fairly simple thing. I'm going to request from that subscription um, like everything it's got. So as the end point, all I want to do is just listen to every single stri string that you're gonna pass me like forever, for whatever that means. My on next, I already had. This is the sort of this is the logic of my endpoint. It just says that like for every message I get in, I need to publish it to my WebSocket output. That's what I do. On error, let's do some really cool error handling. Oops. That's my amazing error handler. And then on complete, I'm gonna close it. So I'm just gonna implement those in the simplest possible way. But what I've done is I now have the subscriber part of my service. So I've just really simply just turned it into a, um, a reactive stream subs subscriber. Now obviously my service isn't going to be compiling anymore. So my client endpoint is, let's rename this so it's more useful. This is going to be my publisher. So before what I did is I added a listener to my publisher, but what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to subscribe to my publisher. It's just, again, a, just a, a different terminology, but it's the same sort of thing. And what it used to do is it used to take a message listener, and now I'm going to say, um, I want you to, I want the subscribe method, the font size on this is not amazing. Um, I want you to take a subscriber. So let's say subscriber, type string. Actually, it needs to be some generic magic. Okay, so now my service is responsible for gluing together my subscriber and my publisher to make sure that they're actually talking to each other. Let's go quickly into the publisher and turn that into a publisher. So, I, this is the subscribe method that I just called. And uh, let's rename this so it's more sensible. This is now a subscriber. So, when I, I am a publisher, when someone subscribes to me, what do I want to do? Well, one of the things I need to do is my subscriber, I need to call Oops, on subscription, on subscribe with a subscription. Let's create that subscription. I'm going to create a class called subscription. I'm going to create an inner class for this. Yeah. 
And I'm going to pass my subscriber into my subscription and, um, and manage it there. And I'll, well, hopefully, it will become clear what we're doing and why we're doing it. So let's create a field for this. So the Reactive Streams API has an idea of a subscription. So I'm going to implement subscription and implement the methods from subscription. And we've already seen the subscription method a little bit because what we did is we called request to request all the items in that stream. So now we need to implement our own subscription. This is because I'm not using any libraries. This is me using the Reactive Streams API, implementing the bare minimum required for me to sort of be able to have a subscriber and a publisher. So I'm going to say something fairly simple. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to track this with a new atomic long. Create a field for this. And then <clears throat> in order to cancel, I just have to set uh, that to uh, zero. And we'll, we'll use this in a minute. So for now, all we need to know is that our subscription has an idea of, this, of the subscriber and the number of things they've asked for. So let's go back to our subscribe method. Now, now I will need to track all of these individual subscriptions that I've created because these subscriptions are going to allow me to send stuff to the people who are subscribed to me. So, oh, subscription. So instead of listeners, I'm going to have subscribe. Oh, no, yeah. Let's forget that. I'm going to change this so that instead of story message listeners, which is what I did before, I'm now, I now have a list of subscriptions. And so I'm going to rename this to be something more useful. So basically, what I'm doing, I already had my message handler idea, but I'm basically formalizing. Instead of having a, a message listener, um, I'm using the, the publisher and subscriber uh, instead. And then what all I have to do is this is my method, which takes um, a message off the WebSocket and is going to publish it to whoever is listening, whoever, is, whoever cares about that message. And of course, who cares about it is all my subscriptions. So every one of my subscriptions, I'm going to tell them about this message. So that's not called message listener anymore. It's called a subscription. And let's just implement an on next method on there to make life a little bit easier. And then this is the bit which says, look, if um, uh, get and decrement. If I still have outstanding requests that this subscriber wanted to wanted me to fulfill, then I'm going to send the um, subscriber. Then I'm going to send this message onto the subscriber. So this is just it's a really simple, really rudimentary subscription. Okay, so it meant that my subscriber was a little bit more, uh, my publisher was a little bit more difficult to implement than my subscriber. But at the end of the day, what I've done is I have, let's compile everything and hope that it works. <laughs> I have my two ends. I have a publisher, which is listening to the WebSockets and then publishing stuff into anything that cares, and a subscriber, which is subscribing to any output from the business logic and then writing that to the WebSockets. Now, I just need to do a quick and slightly boring fix to fix the UI because the UI uses the same, um, the it listens to those client endpoints. So tiny, tiny cheat, just to fix all this up. So instead of, um, instead of implementing message listener, all of these things have to implement subscriber. And all of these things will just basically ask for every single thing that, um, that I could be sent, then um, just send it to me. And we'll look at these UI ones a little bit later on. But at the moment, all I need to do is, uh, is fix them. So let's compile that. I might even go so far as to rerun everything just to make sure everything's doing exactly what it used to do before. But what we've done is um, we have the same infrastructure we had before, more or less, but I'm using Reactive Streams instead. So yes, so I've plugged my publisher and subscriber onto the ends. And that's kind of fine and terribly interesting, but I've just basically, it's doing exactly the same thing it did before, but with slightly more code. OK, that's fun. What exactly did you do that for? 
So the point is to be able to use these reactive APIs. The idea about reactive streams is that these APIs are usable across different libraries. So you can use, for example, RxJava, which is what I'm going to use. You can use Reactor. You can use um, Akka, I think. You can use a bunch of these different reactive libraries and frameworks, but they all talk with the same API. So that means that for something like maybe a microservices type architecture like mine, um, or a modular system, they can, they can be using different implementations of uh, reactive libraries, but be talking to each other over the same reactive API. And they don't even need to be talking, uh, um, talking to other JVM things too, because this is implemented in other languages. So this is kind of, this is where the power comes from. So this is what we did. We implemented our publisher and our subscriber. And um, so I'm going to take a look at some um, individual uses of this. Like, what can we do now that we are reactive? What can we do now? Like, what's, what's the point? So I'm going to take a look at the tweet service to begin with because it's at the end of the line. It's a little bit easier to manage. Let's shut everything down. So what I did before is I had this really nice new feature in um, Java 8, which is files.lines. And it gives you a stream of strings, which represents every single line in that file. I'm going to show the sort of alternative using reactive streams instead of using Java 8 streams. This to do, by the way, is intentional because I didn't really want anyone looking at this going, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. Let's just do that sort of error handling in our microservices. No, don't do that. So, in, um, uh, so now I'm switching from using the reactive APIs to using a reactive implementation. I'm using RxJava as my implementation um, for just because it was the first one that occurred to me. So I'm going to add RxJava to my class path. Oh, no, we don't have class paths in modules. Uh, I'm going to add RxJava to my dependencies. I can create a flowable. So a flowable is, um, is effectively a publisher, but it's kind of it's a stream, if you like, but a reactive stream, not a Java 8 stream, which isn't at all confusing in any way, shape, or form. So I do a flowable. I'm going to do it from um, iterable. I can use a similar thing to the files.lines, but I use files.readalllines, which will give me an iterable from the file path. Um, and then I'm going to do pretty much the same thing that I had in my Java 8 streams, but using reactive streams. So we need to do a filter, which is going to take an S, and I have to say dot not equals OK, and filtering out everything, which is the string OK. Java 8 streams have, has this feature peak, which lets you do something. At that point in the operation, it lets, me, it lets you do something with the item. Um, reactive streams don't have peak, but I can do, do on next instead, which is the same sort of thing. And what I was doing is, um, at this point, I was inserting a delay of 100 milliseconds, mostly for demo purposes, because I needed to be able to show the tweets ticking at some sort of sensible um, tick. So I used peak to sort of inject a 100 millisecond delay into each one of those um, tweets as it gets published, if you like. And then I can do for each, and I can do the same thing. So I can do tweets endpoint on, on next. And so here, we have basically, this is my reactive streams implementation of this. It's, it looks exactly the same, more or less. Um, be warned, it's not exactly the same. It doesn't do the same thing. But um, we'll get onto that a little bit later. What we can actually do is not just do a like-for-like -like translation. We can actually use some of the power of reactive streams instead. So let's take out my Java 8 implementation. The first thing that we can do is, instead of doing for each, so for every element that I see, send it to my subscriber, I actually just have to say, subscribe my subscriber. So my tweet endpoint is a subscriber. The only complication here, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, is that in Java 9, the Reactive Streams API is under flow.subscriber, flow.publisher, flow flow.subscription. And the Reactive Streams API is, is, not, is a different set of classes. And RxJava currently works with the Reactive Streams API because RxJava is not currently compiled and built against Java 9, but it will be. So I need to create an ad adapter which is going to turn my Java 9 subscriber into a, a, an old-fashioned reactive streams thing, which is not complicated at all, so I would just beg you to ignore it completely. So all I'm going to do is just is wrap it in an adapter. 
Okay, so instead of doing for each, I can just subscribe. So I have a subscriber, so just get it to subscribe to the output of this stream. That seems fair enough. Also, this do on next thing always kind of bothered me. It feels like a little bit of a hack. But it, in terms of my functionality that I want, I actually really do want it to tick every 100 milliseconds. That's like a business requirement of mine, if you like. Now, with reactive streams, you can actually um, work on two streams together. Java 8 streams, you have like a stream, and that's it. You use it once, and then you throw it away, and you never use it again. Um, reactive streams, you can, you can actually merge two streams together. So let's create a stream for... Um, a stream of ticks. So I'll say a flowable interval, 100 milliseconds. Let's call this tick. So this is going to, let's fix this. I need to add RxJava to my module info because, you know, Jigsaw likes to keep me up to date. Um, so this thing, this emits, it ha happens to be a long, it doesn't really matter, it emits a long every 100 milliseconds. So every 100 milliseconds, tick, 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 tick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zip that together with my, um, with my files. So I can say zip with my tick. And so that will kind of force my, um, the strings in my file to be emitted every 100 milliseconds. And then I just have to tell it, like, given that I've got two streams, I've got one which takes strings, which is the strings from my file, one which is longs, which is my tick. What do you want me to do with those two things? Well, I don't care about the long. I only care about the about the string value, so just admit the string value. So I, I think this is quite a nice, elegant way to sort of say, okay, in, if I want this stream to be, to be emitted every 100 milliseconds, I just zip it with a stream which emits something every 100 milliseconds. So this is kind of some of the power that you can get from reactive streams that you can't do in, for example, Java 8 streams. Now, let's see if that still runs. So now we are, you can't really see that very well, but we are basically emitting a, a, a tweet from the file every 100 milliseconds. So that's still working. Excellent, that's a good start. Um, what time did I start? How long have I got? <laughs> You'll come back to me with that. Right, so um, what I want to do is apply this reactive streams thing with, uh, with all of my services because, because I can, basically. Now let's look at the user service. I've got 13 minutes. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay. Right. Some of this stuff I will just do because it's boring and not necessarily, not necessarily explain. Now, remember I had a service class which glues together the two ends, the publisher and the subscriber. So instead of taking into that class a function which takes a string and returns a string, a mapping function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give to you, the caller, the user service or the mood service, um, a way to get hold of the publisher and the subscriber and you can do whatever you want to do with those two things. So I'm going to have a buy consumer which takes a, a publisher, publisher of strings and a... Uh, a subscriber of strings. And um, I'm not going to use this message handler anymore because we are going to get rid of the need for message handler. Uh, just refactor that. It doesn't matter. It's going to break everything because we will fix that. And I'm going to call this... This is going to be my business logic for my service. So create that... Uh, put a field for that. And then when I run my service, instead of doing this, uh, instead of gluing the, the client to the, instead of gluing the subscriber to the publisher, I'm going to basically tell the business logic to do its thing. So I'm going to give it the client endpoint, publisher, and the subscriber. So that's all well and good, you say. What's the point? I go to my user service, and what I'm going to do is now, instead of giving it the function, I can now take... Uh, I can now have a publisher and a subscriber, and I can do whatever I want to do to it. So obviously, I'm going to listen to the publisher and do something with the stream of events which comes out of that, and eventually, at some point, plug that into the endpoint subscriber. So again, I'm using um, RxJava. I'm going to create a flowable from a publisher. I'm going to run out of space, publisher. Okay. <clears throat> and 
And then I just need to do the same thing I was doing before. So I use the original function, which was user service, get Twitter handle for tweet, and then glue the subscriber onto the end of that. I mean, it's not super exciting, but the, what, it, what it gives me, which I didn't have before, is I can now use the full power of reactive streams to do whatever I want with the, with the Twitter information that comes in. So before, this, this service had to be really simple because all it did is it took the tweet and it just took the username from it because I couldn't do anything much more complicated than that. But now what I could do is I could have a look at that tweet information, which can be kind of small and, and not very populated or big and very populated. And I can pull out various bits and pieces and create a fully formed user if I want to, rather than just emitting just a, a user handle and so that this gives me a lot more capability inside my user service. And I'll show you an example inside the mood service, which is a bit more complicated. So here in my mood service, again, we're going to have a publisher and a subscriber. We create a flowable from our publisher. can start by just doing the same thing I did before. So I can just do the mapping function like I did before. Add the two subscriber with a subscriber. Okay, and that's that works the same way it worked before. I just have a horrible feeling, yes, my user service doesn't compile. Oh no. Oh yes, because <laughs> I didn't add RxJava to my module info file. Okay, now what I can do, my mood service was reasonably complicated before. It was an example of a, of a Java 8 stream which um, uses a whole chain of operations to take a, um, a tweet and turn it into um, some series of moods. So let me show you what I mean on the mood service. So I take a tweet and if there's like a word in there which is reasonably happy, then I emit the string happy or I emit the string sad or if there's like a word which corresponds to more than one mood, then I can emit a CSV of moods, so sad and happy. And then if there's no mood associated with the tweet, I end up just emitting an empty string. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the tweet that comes in and some string value that comes out the end, which represents the moods. Now, with reactive streams, I can actually change that. So I can actually, instead of thinking in terms of one-to-one -one thing between, I get some input and I can return an output. I turn this stream of tweets into a stream of moods, and there's no correlation. From the UI point of view, that doesn't matter. The UI all only cared about, are people generally happy? Are they generally sad? Do they generally not care? Um, so listening to a stream of individual moods as they get emitted, it doesn't matter to the UI whether they happen to correspond to an individual tweet, one, or multiple tweets, or there's like multiple moods from that. So with reactive streams, I actually think slightly differently about this problem. Let's uh, just put this into another method. Let's call it filter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift almost all of the Java 8 streams from here and chuck them into my reactive stream. There's one slight difference. My flat map needs to, take, needs to be a flowable, not a stream, uh, from array. Um, I have to do a magic incantation, which thank goodness I don't have time to talk about right now, in order to make the flat map work. Uh, I guess the moral of the story is back pressure really does matter, um, especially with reactive streams. So go away and research about that if your service falls over in a heap like mine did. Um, and then all I have to do is, let's get rid of the distinct. So I'm doing the same operation, but instead of what I was doing is I was collecting it into a CSV, into a single CSV for each tweet. And instead of that, I'm actually just going to emit each mood as I find it. So I end up with something like this, where I just get individual moods emitted. So this is something that Reactive Streams gives me. I probably could have done this with the Java 8 stuff, but it didn't make me, I wasn't thinking in those terms. Um, right, so I have five minutes left. We're not going to go into the UI side of stuff because it really doesn't, it, there's not that much interesting there. I just had to change the mood service so that it, it understands that it's not CSV anymore, that it's an individual set of events. This is not super exciting. 
So Java 8 versus Reactive, um, they look the same. Java 8 streams and Reactive streams look the same, but they're not the same. They don't work the same way. So Reactive streams do, are like infinite streams of events that come in. Java 8 streams can be infinite streams as well. Um, but the idea is that with Java 8 streams, uh, Java, with reactive streams, I can have multiple subscribers to my individual stream, for example, or I can zip multiple streams together. I just basically work with them in a, in a completely different way. Whereas Java 8 streams, the way they are at the moment, is more like nice syntax for querying collections. It's not quite the same thing. So reactive streams work with multiple streams. You can have multiple consumers. You can reuse them. Back pressure is extremely important. You need to understand the back pressure on the system. And it does have a very different concurrency model, um, which, uh, yes, which is worth reading about. <laughs> right, other Java 9 features in four and a half minutes. Fine. Convenience factory methods for collections. This is a really, it could be arguably a really silly feature in Java 9, but it's a really nice feature in Java 9. So if I go to... Um, what I can do now, instead of having, um, uh, instead of having arrays, I can say list.of and give it some set of values. Okay, that's fine and not super exciting because before we could say, um, we could say array list, arrays.aslist and do the same thing. But what is more interesting is that you can do this not just with lists, but you can also do it with sets, for example. So you can create yourself a nice unmodifiable set uh, with convenience factory methods. This is kind of, this is really useful, particularly with things like testing. Where it is really useful is, I don't want that as a set. Where it is really useful, in my opinion, is in, it's for maps. So I needed to initialize a map in this particular case, um, and this is the one feature I miss most about Groovy, the ability to write nice maps. Now it's a little bit easier in Java 9, you could say map dot of entries. You can create each one of these things uh, as an entry. Column select. Let's do a find and replace on that. Not that one, honestly. Right, so um, instead of having a static block, you just have um, some nice helper methods for doing a map of entries. It's, it's not as pretty as the groovy way of doing stuff, but it is a lot easier than what we were doing before. You can also, if you've got less than 10, fewer than 10, you can also say map.of, and you could say something like, um, and so on. So you can just give, if you've got a small number, you just give key value pairs in the, in the map.of. So it's, it's a little bit easier for us to work with. It's, it's quite nice. Uh, private methods on interfaces. Now this might seem really silly because like why would you want a private method on an interface when an interface is supposed to give you the interface to implement? Now of course interfaces in Java 8 ended up with um, default methods and static methods. So you can start to have behavior inside your interfaces. So then you end up with interfaces like this, uh, tweet parser, um, which is a genuine interface that I had from, the, from that demo where you have uh, you have copy-paste coding, and there's no way to put that into something which is reusable unless you put it somewhere else. And now you can do that in Java 8, in Java 9. So I refactor this into get value for field. And so now I can reuse that. Obviously, previously, that would have to be public, but now I can say I want that to be private. So I can reuse that functionality between uh, individual methods on my interfaces. So that's quite nice. What else? Uh, new methods on the Streams API. So the Streams API, especially when you're working with, so this is the Java 8 Streams API. With the Java 8 Streams API, especially when you're working with infinite streams, it was quite difficult to tell it, stop now, you're done. Please, stop, no more. Um, and that's a little bit easier now with Java 9. So I can say um, what I had before is I have here a feature which, um, on my leaderboard, I have to go down the list of the, the Twitter um, users and then find the place to insert them. So what I did is I used filter 
to find that place, which was just kind of relied a little bit on the fact that it was ordered. And um, it's fine because there's only 15 entries, but it's not great. So actually what I want to do instead is I can now use take while. So while some condition is true, then do this, and then after that, finish. Or I can do the opposite. I can do drop while. So ignore all of these up until some condition is true. Or I can use a combination of the two to get some things in the middle. Um, so that's great. Now, I've been told to stop like a minute ago. Uh, the pain. Right, so everyone's a little bit worried about Java 9 because they're worried about things like modularity and so forth might break their code. Um, but you can try it out now to see if things will break. And, um, and you might be surprised. You might find there's not as much pain as you thought. There are things going away in Java 9. Lots of things are being removed. Uh, deprecated things are being removed in Java. This has never happened before. It's very exciting. You can delete code. And so lots of things are going away. And there's also some changes to things like logging, for example, and to the garbage collector. So you might end up with some unexpected behavior if you are relying on certain things that um, perhaps you shouldn't have been relying on, like errors in logs, for example. Um, so Java 9 is still evolving. It's not out yet. Uh, so do download the early access thing, but um, be aware that things like Java 9 is evolving, the tools we use are evolving, and these things are still in flux at the moment. Um, don't necessarily rush to apply Jigsaw. You might not need to Jigsawize your whole project. Right? You can still use Java 9 without being modular. That's fine. Um, reactive streams are not the same as Java 8 streams. If you care about this, then definitely read up about that and, and experiment and see what the performance is like, because they do different things. There are, they are for different use cases. And the gain in terms of Java 9, it does encourage good design. I did find that modularity had me thinking about single responsibility, about encapsulation, and about these good design practices. Um, it also encourages new ways of working. So the Reactive Streams API lets you think in terms of like events and, and streams, of, streams of messages or streams of events. Um, and also the REPL, which we didn't get a chance to cover, the REPL is a new way of working with Java as well. And there are lots of little things in there, like private methods on interfaces, collection factory methods, um, new methods on the Java 8 streams, which will just make code that little bit nicer to, to work with. I think it's going to be a little bit like um, when Java 7 got Project Coin, and some of those syntax changes were just a little bit nicer for us to write code with. Um, I have less than zero time for questions, um, but come and grab me any time throughout the day. All of the code, all of the slides, all of, the, um, all of my reference material is available at this link. So um, please go and take a look and see what's there. Um, thank you very much.